am Susan Ingalls and I direct Sustainable Furnishings Council and we're pleased to offer this series of webinars on the third Thursday of every month. Today, covering the topic of antimicrobials in furnishings in this amazing era of COVID-19. And we're privileged to have Dr. Ted Shetler of the Science and Environmental Health Network here as our guest. And we will be hearing from him on this important topic. I also want to hear from all of you. So even though I have you on mute, please type in your questions and comments as they occur to you, and we will read them at the end of the presentation and respond to all your questions. To get started, I would like to give you some background on Sustainable Furnishings Council. We are a membership organization about 14 years old now, and our members are companies that are involved in the residential furnishings industry in various ways. So they might supply materials, they might manufacture any kind of furnishings products, be stores where these things are sold, or design firms that specify furnishings products. Also among our members are important conservation organizations. World Wildlife Fund and Rainforest Alliance helped get us started and remain active with us today. When we started all those years ago, our first job was to determine what are best practices for sustainability in the residential furnishings industry. And then we set standards for recognizing exemplary implementation of those practices. And then we got busy educating, educating industry professionals and also building the market. We have about 400 member companies now. Um, I am seeing that someone is having trouble with audio. So I'm going to ask all attendees, please, to raise your hand if you can hear me, because I want to be sure that you all are hearing. We might have an audio problem. I see that people can hear me. So if you cannot hear, check the speakers and microphone on your own system. I'm glad that most people can hear me. Thank you for letting me know that. Um, and thank you for being involved with us. As I said, we have about 400 member companies now. Each of them have made their own public and verifiable commitment to sustainability to transparency and to continuous improvement. As an organization, we help them realize their own commitment by providing information like we're sharing in this webinar, other educational resources, um, and lots of guidance and marketing support. Members can use the member seal in all their marketing and advertising. If you are interested in the sort of information we're sharing today, I hope you'll consider getting more information from us with our Green Leaders Program, which is a six hour, six CEU course that covers a lot about sustainability issues in the furnishings industry, questions to ask, answers to look for as you're specifying product. It also inc includes um, a very powerful sales training module that is partly based on consumer research we have done over the last 10 years or so. So I hope you'll consider joining us for that course, which is available online anytime, like most things are these days. As you know, sustainability is an umbrella term. There are many issues that fall under this wide umbrella of sustainability. And we at Sustainable Furnishings Council tend to worry about all of them. 
different member companies are concentrated in one area or another, we think that that's fine, no matter whether you were at the beginning of your sustainability journey or have been eco-focused from the start. The planet is in enough trouble that we all need to start where we are and go forward in protecting ecosystems and supporting communities and living in harmony with those ecosystems and in bolstering local economies so that they can protect their local ecosystems. This is important for us in the furnishings industry because we are connected to all these issues. And of most importance to us today, I'll say that we do address all the issues as they relate to residential furnishings with our initiatives. Of importance to us today are our concerns about how harmful chemicals make their way into furnishings products. There are actually five of them that are most commonly found in furnishings. Our What's a ma it Made of initiative is to encourage transparency in our supply <clears throat> chains and to stimulate innovation towards the elimination of these harmful chemicals that are most commonly found in furnishings. Sometimes we're not even aware of their being there. And because of that, we at Sustainable Furnishings now are working on gathering information from industry professionals. I invite you to participate in our What's It Made Of survey. You can click this link now and at the end of today's presentation, you can go back to that survey and fill the form. It's anonymous if you don't want to tell us who you are, but whether you want to tell us who you are or not, we want to know what you know about where these chemicals occur in furnishings and what health effects they might be related to because the fact is that they are all persistent and they um, are directly related to harm to human health. And so we are especially glad to have with us today Dr. Ted Shetler who is a specialist in antimicrobials and is going to be talking with us about antimicrobials in furnishings in this day and age. Dr. Shetler is science director of the Science and Environmental Health Network. He is also science advisor to Healthcare Without Harm, which is an organization seeking to reduce adverse public health and environmental impacts of healthcare institutions. He has a medical degree from Case Western Reserve University and a master's degree in public health from Harvard University. He is author or co-author of books, monographs, white papers, and journal articles addressing various aspects of human health and the environment. Among them are antimicrobials in hospital furnishings. Do they help reduce healthcare associated infections? And antimicrobials in hospital furnishings, do they help combat COVID-19? He has served on advisory committees for, of the US EPA and National Academy of Sciences. And we're so glad to have him with us today. Thank you, Dr. Shetler, for being here. Thank you, Susan, for the kind introduction uh, and for the opportunity to speak to you all today on this uh, webinar. So I am going to address antimicrobials in the time of coronavirus. Um, and what I propose to, uh, if I can get there, if I propose to cover are, the, are these topics, I'm going to give a few definitions to begin just to get us on the same page. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the SARS-CoV-2 virus and some of its features. Uh, then uh, some strategies uh, for uh, prevention with an integrated look uh, at a hierarchy of controls. 
Uh, and with that as background, to talk about a bit about the potential role for antimicrobials in products and materials, and then where I think we uh, may be headed. Uh, to begin, just to get us on the same page, when I use the term microorganism or microbe, uh, that's a general term that covers the whole range of bacteria, viruses, fungi, and some parasites. Uh, so an antimicrobial agent or, or a product is an agent that kills some microorganisms or stops their growth. And it's important to keep in mind that their effectiveness varies. That is, some have a broad spectrum of activity across those various microbes, whereas others are much more targeted. The term cleaning is uh, means the removal of visible soil from surfaces, and normally we accomplish that with soap and water or sometimes enzymatic products, but uh, that is distinct from disinfection, which is a process that eliminates many or all pathogenic microorganisms on objects. And there are various ways of doing that. Chemically, uh, chemicals are one way. UV light is another example. And then heat can be used. Uh, and uh, I, I want to make certain that we think about cleaning and disinfection as being different processes, but often combined for effectiveness. And it's particularly important to keep that in mind, as we'll see for this particular virus, SARS-CoV-2. So this is a graphic representation of this virus. It's an RNA virus, and it's surrounded by an envelope. So here you can see the RNA strand in the middle of this, surrounded by this lipid bilayer, or a bilayer that's made out of fat. And that lipid bilayer is studded with uh, various kinds of proteins, including the spike protein. Uh, shown here, which is the one that's responsible for its being able to gain access to the interior of cells, uh, usually in our nose, throat, lungs, or, or the mucous membranes of our eyes, which are the common entry points for this virus. Uh, I point out this lipid bilayer as being important uh, because plain soap and water uh, will disrupt this membrane and render this virus non-infectious. It's one of the reasons why we uh, emphasize hand hygiene with soap and water so much and uh, soap and water cleaning uh, in surfaces in our homes and so on because it's very effective at disrupting this lipid bilayer. Now, this virus, as many of you are undoubtedly aware, is predominantly spread through airborne transmission. And we can see here in this uh, little figure at the top that when people speak, uh, cough, sneeze, laugh, uh, yell, uh, various size droplets are expelled from the mouth. Uh, and the larger ones tend to drop to the surface fairly close to the person who's expelled them, whereas smaller ones can travel longer distances. And that becomes important as we try to understand how this uh, virus is spread and the disease is transmitted. Uh, aerosols, which are these very fine droplets that are smaller than a few microns in diameter, can actually remain suspended in the air for several hours and travel farther than the larger droplets, which tend to be deposited uh, much more quickly uh, and closer to the person. Uh, and I've given here uh, a couple of references for those who are, of you who are interested in, in this. And I also would point out that recently, the National Academy of Sciences actually had a two-day symposium uh, uh, on airborne transmission, aerosol transmission of this virus, uh, which is available on their website now if you're interested in seeing those presentations and slides that were presented. And then we wonder about contaminated surfaces and how much they play a role in transmission, um, where, for example, a person deposits the virus onto a, on a table or chair or countertop, and then another person comes along and touches it with their hand and then can transfer the virus uh, into their mouth uh, or onto their face uh, in an indirect fashion. 
we still don't have any good evidence that that's an important uh, pathway of exposure to this virus. Uh, the Centers for Disease Control continues to update their uh, evaluation of transmission pathways, and it still remains uh, a, a, an unproven method of exposure. My guess is that it actually is more important in some settings than in others. Uh, for example, in healthcare institutions where patients with COVID-19 are being treated, the infectious virus has been uh, recovered from various objects in the room of those patients. So presumably that represents a, a, an important potential uh, pathway of transmission for people who are in those, in those rooms and, and coming in contact. I, I suspect it's also important in a home where someone is in, infected uh, and potentially depositing virus on various surfaces if that person is not isolated. We know that this is a highly contagious uh, virus and can be spread even from uh, asymptomatic infected people. Now, I, what I've done here in this diagram is to just try to incorporate these ideas into the indoor environment so we can begin to th think about intervention strategies. So if we have a person here who has the uh, infection and they are uh, releasing it from the resp respiratory tract through coughing, sneezing, speaking loudly, laughing, and so on, uh, the virus can be deposited on surfaces, it can be aerosolized and suspended uh, and travel much more a, a larger distance in the room than, than these larger droplets. Uh, but then we have to introduce the whole idea of outdoor air ventilation. And this has become an, incre an increasingly important uh, strategy for uh, dealing with this virus in an indoor environment with dramatic effects in terms of uh, getting rid of the aerosols that might be suspended. And if you can't increase the outdoor air ventilation because you have windows, for example, that don't open or it's uh, not uh, seasonably warm enough to do that, um, in buildings where you have opportunities for recirculating air through HVAC systems, you can begin to see how increasing the airflow through these systems and putting in a high efficiency filter into the systems that is in extraordinarily effective in terms of reducing the uh, aerosol uh, concentration may be present in the indoor uh, air environment. Now, this is the concept of the hierarchy of controls, which actually comes out of occupational medicine, but uh, really is applicable, applicable uh, beyond the workplace. It's, a, it's an integrated systems approach to dealing with hazards in the workplace, and we can easily see how this applies not only to the workplace, but to the home environment as, as well, where there are strategies at multiple levels for getting rid of a hazard that begin, for example, with physically removing the hazard completely, uh, ending up with the much more precise and individual level of, of uh, providing personal protective equipment to individual people. And what the hierarchy of controls wants to make clear is that whereas the most effective strategies are often uh, up here at this level, they're the, often the most difficult to implement. And we tend often to begin to look down here at the individual level of prevention uh, and, 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 and uh, fail to take advantage of some of the mid-level uh, uh, opportunities for getting rid of a hazard. So physically removing the hazard is obviously the most effective, then the problem is gone. But short of that, there are engineering controls and administrative controls that can also be implemented, such as isolating people from the hazard or changing the, pay, the way people work. And we're beginning to see these ideas take place now as we're thinking about how to get back to work, how to get back to school, uh, uh, and how to conduct our lives, even in our homes, in the age of, uh, of COVID-19. So uh, in the hospital, for example, we see these various strategies at various levels being implemented, all the way from personal protective equipment for hospital personnel, importance of hand hygiene, and, and making certain that people uh, do that uh, constantly, cleaning and disinfection of surfaces, testing and isolation, and imp improving, uh, increasing room ventilation, 
using negative pressure in patients' rooms where the uh, person is infected so that the air in that room is exhausted to the outside rather than being allowed to enter the common rooms in the, re the rest of the hospital. We're seeing some of the same strategies at, co at the community level with spatial separation, masks, hand hygiene, cleaning and disinfection, uh, and testing and isolation. These are all familiar to you, but these represent various levels of the hierarchy of control. In, in homes, uh, emphasis on hand hygiene, cleaning and disinfection, and when someone in the home is infected, using masks and isolation uh, and improving ventilation are all uh, strategies that can be employed. And in other workplaces, uh, we, we are beginning to see, for example, frequent illness checks. So uh, don't admit anybody to the building uh, who has symptoms. And we're beginning to see that rather routinely as people are getting workplaces reopened. Em deploy healthy building strategies, such as opening windows or increasing the outdoor and air ventilation rates with HVAC systems, uh, passing recirculated air through high efficiency filters. And that, by the way, uh, is a useful strategy in a home as well, because these high efficiency filters uh, in air purifiers in the home will, will pick up and trap the virus along with other small particles. And then cleaning and disinfection. And then the question we're exploring today is also is to do what other antimicrobial technologies add value. In other words, if we start putting antimicrobial uh, features into surfaces in, in uh, products in our home, uh, does that add uh, value to reducing the uh, likelihood of transmission? Physical distancing and, uh, and personal protective equipment where necessary. These are all strategies that, that are, are being employed to varying degrees. So to get to the question of antimicrobials in products and surfaces in our home, uh, we need to think a little bit about how long does the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus remain infectious on various surface materials. And I emphasize here infectivity because the virus, like all viruses, uh, cannot survive outside of other cells uh, for uh, lengthy periods of time. And the, the amount of time that can remain infectious varies depending on the surface that it might be applied to, but it also varies from one virus to another. So when this virus first was identified, we were all interested in, in the answer to this question, how long does it remain infectious on various surface materials? And so I've cited here two papers that were published earlier this year that answered that question. Um, and you can see here, uh, that the amount of time that this virus remains infectious varies with the, the uh, surface material uh, from days uh, on plastic, stainless steel, and glass to mere hours on pure copper or on paper, for example. And then there are some intermediates like uh, one day on, on car cardboard, uh, two days on wood or cloth. There's some variability uh, between the, uh, between these two studies, but there's, they're largely in the same ballpark. So this gives you some idea of, of, uh, of, of what we need to be concerned about in terms of the uh, infectivity of this virus uh, as we think about uh, disinfection uh, strategies. So cleaning and disinfection remains a hallmark uh, and important strategies for uh, getting rid of this virus, rend rendering it non-infectious. Cleaning with soap and water, for the reasons I previously mentioned about how soap itself disrupts the lipid membrane in this virus. Then the EPA has developed a long list of disinfectants which are effective against this virus, and it's available on their website. There are several hundreds of disinfectant products listed there now. Um, the end list is the one that addresses this virus uh, specifically. Uh, and I would note that the disinfectants themselves have variable toxicity. And also it's important to keep in mind what's called the dwell time. And that varies from uh, uh, several minutes up to or ten, 10 minutes or so. Um, and what that 
what that relates to is how long the surface needs to be re remain wet with the disinfectant for it to be effective at kids killing this virus. Uh, some of the toxic effects of some of the disinfectants that are uh, listed on the end list, uh, some are respiratory irritants or sensitizers. Um, some can cause or trigger asthma. And I've just given a couple of examples here. Uh, quaternary ammonium compounds, which are highly featured on the uh, end list, uh, can cause respiratory irritation uh, and respiratory symptoms, including asthma uh, in susceptible people. And also uh, plain bleach can do that. So when, when using these products, if using these products, it's important to use them in a place that's well ventilated. And uh, people should be uh, applying them using rubber gloves and uh, uh, respiratory protection if it's not possible to uh, really improve the ventilation. There are uh, also listed less toxic examples that are effective against this particular virus. And I've listed several of them here, including uh, hydrogen peroxide, um, and then ethyl alcohol and isopropyl alcohol. Both of those are commonly found in the high hand sanitizers, which we're uh, all using. And then there's citric acid and L-lactic -lact acid. Now, these are effective against this particular virus, but they may have limited effectiveness against other uh, microorganisms. It's also important to keep in mind that the, the surface material needs to be compatible with the disinfectant being used. So for example, for example, uh, certain textiles or other materials cannot uh, safely be uh, disinfected with hydrogen peroxide without damaging the material. So that goes into uh, uh, the calculus when deciding which disinfectant to use on which surface. Now, a few years ago, uh, I, I was a principal author and, and with others uh, wrote a report for Healthcare Without Harm uh, called Antimicrobials and Hospital Furnishings. Do, we help, do they help reduce healthcare associated infections? And we explored that question in this report and it's freely available at the URL uh, shown here and it's a, you can find it easily on the Healthcare Without Harm website. Uh, we recognize that healthcare-associated infections are a systemic problem uh, that uh, require multi-level, multi-factorial interventions in order to reduce their incidence. We explored the role of contaminated surfaces in uh, the uh, transmission of healthcare-associated infections. We noted the importance of cleaning and disinfection, which, be, which is really a hallmark uh, important intervention in reducing HAIs, along with many of the other things that I've already mentioned, such as hand hygiene and, uh, and so on. We summarized antimicrobial uh, coatings and surface technologies uh, and their efficacy in this report, and also summarized uh, laboratory test methods, which are used to evaluate the effectiveness of these technologies when they're uh, put into uh, products. Um, and some of these uh, laboratory test methods have been modified to evaluate uh, the impacts of, on viral loads and not just bacterial, but also viral loads. Uh, then more recently, just uh, last month, we uh, released an addendum to that report specifically addressing uh, uh, antimicrobials and hospital furnishings in, in, uh, in the age of SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19. And that report is also available on the Healthcare Without Harm website. The, the kinds of technologies that have been deployed in products and materials include chemicals. Uh, and I just to give it as an example here, quaternary ammonium compounds, which are widely used disinfectants, have been uh, deployed in various ways. There are other chemicals that have been used in the past that are slowly uh, being phased out for very good reason. Things like triclosan, for example, uh, which it has a number of hazardous properties, uh, as well as limited effectiveness, it, it turns out. And so we're seeing less and less of that. 
It's been removed, uh, for example, from many personal care products, but also from other solid materials. Then there are a number of metals, copper, zinc, and silver included, uh, which uh, have antimicrobial properties. And uh, these have been deployed in various formulations uh, and, uh, and in various ways to impart antimicrobial uh, pr uh, properties to surfaces. There are antimicrobial polymers that uh, are being developed and have been developed. Some include the quaternary ammonium compounds, which are either mixed with or attached to the polymer, for example. Um, but as we noted in our 2016 report, and as continues to be the case in healthcare settings, their efficacy in reducing healthcare acquired infections has not yet been shown. Without doubt, these um, uh, technologies can reduce bacterial and viral loads on certain surfaces to varying degrees, but their if efficiency or their if, uh, if efficacy in terms of reducing infections has not yet been shown. And yet, it in, in the time of COVID-19, there has been obvious pressure uh, on manufacturers to expand their more general use, um, particularly in things like furnishings. Uh, and the question then arises, well, will this be driven by data where we have actual data that's, that's, that's studying their efficacy, safety, and durability, or more by hope and assumptions? So I'll just explore those uh, questions a bit. This is a uh, just a screenshot and an example of a paper recently published in a journal called Nanomaterials, where the authors really began asking the question about, well, can nanotechnology, including some deploying some of these silver, uh, copper, and zinc in nanoparticles, uh, help uh, in the fight against uh, SARS-CoV-2. So material sciences is obviously very interested in, in the answers to these questions. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what is being developed or promoted now more recently? Uh, and there are various uh, kinds of nanoparticles of, of copper, silver, and zinc, which are being deployed in various ways, sometimes in what are called zeolites. Zeolites are uh, small nanoporous aluminous silicates that uh, in the pores they can serve as reservoirs for ions of these uh, metal uh, metals that then are slowly released to the surface just to impart uh, antimicrobial properties. As I mentioned, there are antimicrobial polymers that continue to be developed uh, and some in some cases deployed. These collectively have multiple mechanisms of action with regard to their antimicrobial properties. Uh, some of them uh, damage the membrane uh, of viruses or uh, bacteria. Some inhibit nucleic acid replication. Some denature enzymes. Uh, some cause generalized oxidative stress. So there's a variety of mechanisms of uh, antimicrobial properties that are involved. So the question is, are they effective? Uh, and before answering that question, uh, one needs to ask, well, what are we trying to accomplish? What are our goals? Uh, that will help us determine whether or not they are effective. Our, our goal is our goal to reduce the microbial burden on a surface or to reduce the transmission or to reduce actual infections uh, that are caused uh, by the microbe of interest? Or are they being added to increase a sense of safety and security to make people feel more confident in returning to a workplace? These are important questions that help us determine how to uh, evaluate efficacy. Um, some of the things we want to consider when we're thinking about the efficacy of a product is how was it evaluated? And how does it compare, how does that compare to conditions of use? So for example, if the product was evaluated for antimicrobial properties in a laboratory over a short period of time, uh, how does that compare to where it's going to be used, where it's going to be subject to cleaning and disinfection? Or how does it, does it last over time? Or is it a, a short-lived property? How generalizable uh, is the evaluation to a range of microbes and to coronaviruses specifically? 
because some antimicrobials are more effective against certain microbes than others. And how long does the effect last under conditions of use? Um, and I would just remind you that uh, in the um, uh, report that I mentioned that is available on the Healthcare Without Harm website, uh, we summarized in Appendix C some of the uh, test methods which are used for answering uh, those questions. So we have considerable data on the antibacterial properties of various antimicrobial products, but they're not generalizable to all bacterial pathogens. We do have growing data on the uh, impacts on the infectivity of various viruses. Most of those data address influenza, HIV, uh, hepatitis C, HSV, and adenoviruses. Uh, and we're beginning to get some data or more data on the impacts of these products on coronaviruses specifically. Um, and what you'll sometimes find is uh, a product will be evaluated for its antiviral activity on a surrogate for SARS-CoV-2. Uh, in other words, sometimes the evaluation is done on a less dangerous coronavirus used as a surrogate for drawing inferences about how that product will uh, deal with SARS-CoV-2. Trying to get the slide to advance and it seems to be stuck. Hmm. There's uh, this, uh, I won't go through this in great detail, but I just want to point out that this is an example of a, of a test method for evaluating the antiviral, antiviral activity of, of uh, uh, antimicrobial property in a solid material. And basically, what is done uh, using standardized test methods is first of all you, you culture the virus in a cell culture then you uh, take samples of the material that you're evaluating for its antiviral properties uh, and a control sample that does not have that anti antiviral property added to it and you coat a, a known amount of virus onto the surface of that product uh, you let it sit there for a prescribed uh, period of time under certain environmental conditions, and then you remove the whatever is left of uh, the surface uh, inoculum and put it back into a cell culture and see whether or not the virus re re remained infective or if its infectivity was destroyed with its residence time on the surface of that product. And then that result is reported as a percent of log reduction in viral infectivity uh, on, the, on the treated sample compared to the control sample. So you get an idea about the effectiveness. And these test methods have been developed now for both solid materials and also for textiles. So where are we at this point? Uh, as of now, there is no evidence that adding antimicrobial properties to the surfaces of products adds value to the array of recommendations that I've previously described for reducing the transmission of this uh, virus or the incidence of COVID-19. But I, I would also emphasize that that could change because this is really a shifting landscape as we learn more and as more products are developed. And right now, the US EPA is developing a standardized approach to evaluate products for their long-lasting disinfected properties, including for SARS-CoV-2. And for those who are interested, you can go to the US EPA website uh, and in their COVID-19 section and just see where they stand right now with the evaluation of various products for their long-lasting disinfecting properties uh, related to SARS-CoV-2 specifically. So uh, here's, uh, I think, where I think I end up anyway, and I and, uh, would propose this uh, for us to think about and to discuss. Um, for purchasers, if you're considering purchasing furnishings with antimicrobial properties with the hope that they may either reduce the viral load or reduce viral transmission 
or reduce infections and illness or help reduce concern and add a sense of security. If, if, that's, your, if that's what's driving your decision making, look for evidence of efficacy and consider downsides before making a decision. So what would we look for? Uh, studies of efficacy, as I've described, in terms of how did they reduce the infectivity, what methods were used for evaluating that, what were the experimental conditions, and how do they compare to the real-world conditions of use, and how long do the virucidal properties in this product last under conditions of use, and how do we know that? How was it evaluated? And what are the implications for proven cleaning and uh, disinfection protocols? Remembering that cleaning and disinfection are extremely effective against uh, this virus uh, in very in very short periods of time. Uh, and if we if we were to mistakenly uh, introduce a false sense of security into a home or workplace by using antimicrobial uh, products uh, that were built into uh, materials, for example, are we actually running into a potential problem with reducing and relaxing our interventions of, of cleaning and disinfection? And then are there important adverse health or environmental impacts of adding this antimicrobial to a product? For example, if, if the antimicrobial property is not bound to the material and can leach out you can get direct human exposures, uh, which could be associated with adverse impacts on the person, depending on what the antimicrobial is. For example, skin reactions or dermal absorption of nanoparticles, which could lead to uh, adverse uh, impacts. Are the releases of the antimicrobial into the environment so that it uh, then could indirectly uh, affect uh, humans downstream or wildlife exposures? So for example, quaternary ammonium uh, compounds are regularly found now in wastewater, uh, in uh, sewage sludge, and in various environmental samples. So we're beginning to realize that our widespread use of disinfectants is really beginning to contaminate the general environment with, with the ones we've used. Triclosan is another example of, of, a, of a chemical I previously mentioned that uh, is, is widely found now in the environment because of its use in consumer products. Um, are we inadvertently facilitating antimicrobial resistance in microbes that could be transferred to other organisms? And that, that's not just a trivial question or a theoretical question, but there are examples uh, uh, in, in various settings where we begin to see how we select out for organisms that are resistant to certain antimicrobials. And then finally, our are we altering microbial communities on surfaces in our homes by doing this? Um, and we're beginning to learn a lot more about the, inter, the indoor microbiome, about the, 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 the critters we live with routinely that are on all of our surfaces, on our skin, uh, our, our furnitures in a house, our carpeting, uh, our walls, uh, and recognizing that when we disrupt this in, in indoor microbiome and begin to select out for certain organisms uh, as opposed to others, we could inadvertently been, be selecting out for pathogens as well. So it's an important uh, topic to think about, uh, and we're learning a lot more about the indoor uh, microbiome in recent years. For manufacturers, uh, uh, I would suggest that without more data that we should avoid making added antimicrobials a standard option for any products, except for those uh, where the antimicrobial is used solely for product protection. And I can go into that in more detail if you're interested in, but so, in some cases, antimicrobials are in a material because they're there to protect the product itself from deterioration, not because uh, they are there to provide a health benefit. Uh, we think that antimicrobials should be a must select option so we can make the, that decision clear as well as track the demand for products containing the antimicrobials. Uh, and if antimicrobial properties are added to high touch surfaces on request because of this uh, virus, use technologies that are proven effective in reducing the infectivity of, of them under conditions of use.
And, and then I would suggest it would be very helpful for manufacturers to take the lead or collaborate in the design or ex execution of a research agenda to fill some of the data gaps that I've described in terms of uh, efficacy and risks associated with adding them. And if you do add them, require full toxicity testing and studies of potential leaching and evaluations of potential human or environmental exposure to any my antimicrobial use, so that we'll have uh, a, a full sense of, of, of the data that are driving this and the potential downsides, and it should be transparent to uh, purchasers uh, as well. So, Susan, that's all I have. Thank you very much, and I'd be happy to take any questions or comments. Thank you so much, Dr. Shetler. That is fascinating and useful information. And we do have some questions that have already come in and I bet people will um, type in more questions. Y'all, there's time for you to type in more questions. Um, and there, the first question is, can we have the presentation? And I know that it, uh, the recording is going to be available on our website in a few days. Um, yes, so you're, welcome to, you're welcome to share the slides. Great, thank you so much. Here's a question. Would you be able to post the length of time the virus is potentially detectable on different surfaces. So the you gave us a, a slide for um, when it is infectious on different surfaces, we think, um, but this question is about it being potentially detectable. Oh, yeah. sorry, they're asking for us to put it on the SFC site. Yes, that'd be a good idea. <laughs> so maybe if, with your uh, permission, Dr. Shetler, we'll put that slide somewhere on our website and use that as the link to the recording or the entire slide deck. How does that sound? No, that's fine. fine. And I think it's important. That's That, that question is important because uh, the... the we can detect the viral RNA uh, mm -hmm. on on a surface long after it's lost its infectivity. I mean, the, the, uh -huh. analytic, the, the, the analytic methods have become so sensitive that it's possible to detect the RNA. Uh, but the question is, is it infectious? And so that's why that those two studies were important because um, you could you could find the RNA. Uh, probably long, long after it had lost its infectivity. So uh -huh. that's why, well, that's why I emphasized infectivity so much. Great, thank you, thank you. Next question, I've heard silver woven into textiles has been proven to not be efficacious in reducing microbes or smell. Sometimes socks are sold with silver woven in. Can you address that? Yeah, uh, there are various ways to deploy silver in textiles, uh, and uh, the, the the business about smells is interesting because uh, so I mentioned right at the end that we should differentiate between antimicrobials that are added for a health purpose and those that are added for product protection, mm -hmm. and uh, I won't get too too far down in the weeds on this, but uh, what the Basically, what happens is the US EPA allows uh, a manufacturer of a product to put an antimicrobial into that product for product protection without mm -hmm. going through a full pesticide regu regulatory evaluation for its efficacy in terms of reducing uh, microbes if they're being added for a health purpose. Mm -hmm. And so, <laughs> What you will find, for example, socks that have silver embedded in them, and there, and and it's very clearly labeled. It says it helps control odor. The U.S. EPA uh, has concluded that odor control is not a proposed health benefit, but rather it's an aesthetic benefit, and so it allows the manufacturer to put the silver in the sock without going through a full evaluation of its efficacy. Mm -hmm. So. Um, you will find lots of silver impregnated products on the market where from socks to uh, other clothing to textiles mm -hmm. to cutting boards 
uh, and so on. And if there, if if it's being added, if the manufacturer says that it's for odor control or stain control or something, they don't have to go through a full efficacy evaluation. Mm -hmm. So it's 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 a marketing uh, it's a marketing uh, opportunity that some have grasped, but it's important that we not draw health-based conclusions from that. Yeah. Another um, important thing about materials and health in our industry, uh, there's a comment here that when a handle, for instance, when metal hardware has a coating, it's usually a polymer. So if it is a copper handle and you think, oh, this is antimicrobial, watch out, it probably has a polymer coating on it if it's on your dresser drawer. Here is a question. Um, what are your thoughts on hydrochlorous acid in terms of safety and effectiveness? I have heard of using it as a fog in homes and schools. Would this negatively affect the microbiome? Yeah, I, a couple of things there. I think it, it it is quite effective, and I think you'll find it on the end list, and it is being uh, used um, uh, in in schools uh, and workplaces, I'm aware of. Uh, the 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 concern I have is that if it's used as a fog, you're aerosolizing it, and that means it's being inhaled to some degree. And uh, if if a, a person inhales it, uh, you could clearly get respiratory irritation and potentially uh, trigger asthma attacks or even asthma onset. Um, so I think that for some, uh, there, are, there are various ways of applying disinfectants and wiping them on is one way, but then spraying and fogging are getting some traction. And I have seen a number of reports uh, of, of uh, recommendations, not just from me, but from others to, to uh, be very careful with that because if you're fogging, you're creating aerosols, and uh, if you're you have people who are exposed in a home or a school room, for example, uh, you're going to get respiratory uh, inhalation exposures that you'd like to avoid. Mm -hmm. Well, that leads to the next question, which is, um, what are your thoughts on using UV technology versus antimicrobial? Yeah. Uh, it's it's an important question and it's being explored fairly widely. Um, one needs to be careful about uh, a couple of things. You, you need to have the right wavelength of UV light that will uh, kill the virus and other microbes, um, and 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 it's less harmful to people. But you also have to have a long enough exposure time, and. Um, I heard this discussed, for example, in one of the National Academy webinars where it was pointed out that there are a number of products that are being promoted for sale about waving a wand of UV light around in your kitchen or something, but there's not nearly enough exposure time to have much effectiveness. So on the other hand, uh, what is happening uh, it, that seems to be very effective is deploying UV light uh, on a ceiling uh, in a room where you have an opportunity uh, with with ventilation and recirculating air to bring air past the UV light uh, as it's recirculating, and uh, it it seems to be very effective. So yes, there are definitely ways to to deploy UV technologies, but you need to look carefully at uh, how long the the UV light is being exposed to the surfaces or to the air. Uh, and under what conditions to so that you don't uh, end up uh, uh, with a false sense of, of security. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We have several questions about materials and um, certifications. And this question sort of makes it uh, makes the point. Well, healthcare is an industry that has to evaluate the risk versus the benefit given the riskier environment for contamination. However, residential design allows for more individuals to make that decision for themselves. 
is there a third party verification or other trusted source to educate designers to understand what is fact and what is green health washing? I believe that the precautionary principle and antimicrobial finishes feel very risky to promote. Um, and there was a, a question um, about what are the best sources to look for information? Would it be the EPA? Would it be the CDC? What can you recommend, Dr. Shetler? Well, uh, it's a great question. Uh, EPA uh, will not be getting into any uh, certification programs. Right. Uh, they'll, they'll obviously evaluate products and, and so on, but uh, won't make uh, recommendations, uh, nor I think will the CDC. The certification programs are usually done by third parties and nonprofits. Um, you might actually have a better idea of that than I do. I know that the Green Science Policy Institute has mm -hmm. uh, uh, a number of uh, recommendations about the use of these various chemicals in uh, in consumer products, including in home furnishings. But you might, you might have a better idea about certification yes. programs than I yes. do. Yes, and well, to tell you the truth, one of the reasons we're doing this survey to find out what industry professionals know about where harmful chemicals occur in furnishings um, and, and how they affect consumers, we're doing it because there there is a dearth of information. <laughs> so we plan to develop educational information and, and it'll be working with partners like those that you mentioned. Uh, so Green Sciences Policy Institute, Center for Environmental Health and others, Health and Materials Lab and others. I'm gonna ask another question. I think we're drawing near the end of time, but on materials, do you have anything to say about aluminum or about um, quartz crystal quart countertops? Aluminum is, is often used in um, furniture, you know, cast aluminum chairs. Would such furniture be more beneficial in social settings like the workplace or in, um, in restaurants? Would it be better than uh, a chair made out of wood, for instance, as far as antiviral properties. You know, I, I I have not run into anything about the antimicrobial properties of aluminum. It's not okay. Uh, so I I I confess I haven't I haven't researched that specifically, but it's not one of the metals that has been deployed because of antimicrobial properties. Yeah, okay. Um, and how about quartz, um, which is commonly used for countertops? Do you know anything about quartz properties? Uh, the, uh, well, um, I, I don't. I, the one thing I do know that I would say is that one would need to be uh, attentive to how porous it is. Okay. Because, uh, you know, for example, granite countertops. Uh, mm -hmm. are quite porous and mm -hmm. uh, what what that enables is for um, a biofilm or microbes to begin to gather in these micro pores you think it's a solid hard smooth surface but in fact it's full of pores uh, and that can actually create uh, a reservoir for microbes so mm -hmm. I, I don't know about quartz specifically but uh, it would be worth thinking about how porous it is for a countertop uh, as you begin to think whether it's uh, a good idea to do it, considering whether yeah. it might harbor germs and microbes in, in small pores. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you did talk about how material science, material scientists are kind of all over this. So probably we need to find a material scientist to answer some of these questions. But another one here that is is about quartz polymers. Um, are these being added the, to uh, the zinc bath? for fabrics. Now, I don't expect you to know that, Dr. Shetler, but I think I, I that is- I don't know if, I don't know if they're being added, but uh, I do, I do recommend that when you be, when you begin to 
ask, ask that question, that sounds like uh, an additive uh, approach rather than so. Yeah. And and then you you see what happens is that the the antimicrobial agent, whatever it is, can leach out if it's additive, uh, and, uh, and and suddenly you lose those properties. So that that's yeah. that's happening in a lot of textiles where it's being added after the polymer is already spun, and it doesn't bind to the polymer and it leaches out and it loses its properties very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Good, a good point. Um, I think we've got time for just one more question here, and it is about recommendations for um, cleaning materials that are less harmful. Um, and and of course, you have recommended just plain soap and water. Um, but is there anything else, any resource you want to share for less toxic disinfectant cleaners for the home? Yeah, for for so cleaning soap and water, but then disinfecting. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. One one resource okay. you might want to go to is uh, is uh, the San Francisco Department of Environment uh, uh -huh. has developed uh, a list of of. Uh, disinfectants, not cleaning agent, uh -huh. but disinfectants, um, um, and evaluated them for their toxic properties as well as their effectiveness. So that would be one, one resource Excellent. to go to. There are also a design for the environment disinfectants on the US EPA website. Great, great. So the city of San Francisco and design for the environment at the EPA website. Great, great. Dr. Shetler, thank you so much for the wealth of information you have shared with us. Thank you for your work in this arena. I think it's very, very important, and I really, really appreciate what you and your colleagues are doing. Thank you. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you uh, for, for holding the series. Thank you. It's a that's a pleasure too. And so I hope everybody will join us again next month on the third Thursday for the topic we'll be discussing then. Next month we will be discussing wood, specifically our wood sourcing um, scorecard. The wood furniture scorecard 2020 will be released a month from today. So until then, and thank you again, all of you, but especially Dr. Shetler. Bye now.